Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity you give us even now to gather together, to look into the things of the ancient past as they connect with the people that you set aside for a specific purpose. Uh, We know that Israel is precious in your sight, that you have not lost sight of her, that your love for her never dies, never wavers, despite Israel's um, often uh, deep unfaithfulness. We know that that your ways are far higher than ours, that you are much different than we, and we thank you that your patience endures, even with all of us. Uh, thank you for your patience for, toward the church and for each and every one in it, that you know our plight, that you know our weakness, that you know our inclination, as Paul says, to do that which is sin, that we know to be sin, even though we desire not to do it. We thank you that you work with us and that you uh, have that patience to come alongside us and help guide us into all righteousness. Um, We know that one day we will be with you forever, that we will no longer know sin, the sin nature or its, its wicked effects on our hearts. We praise you that that day is coming and that we can work toward it and that we can encourage one another with the anticipation that things will be new because we will be in resurrected and new bodies for all of eternity. We thank you that, that that which lies ahead is beyond what the mind in this world, in this life, can comprehend. It's so qualitatively different that even the gospel writers, even the writers of the New Testament letters were unable to fully comprehend that which would await each one of them, and awaits us now. Father, um, guide us now as we take a look back into the days of Joseph and his relatives to understand the connection between the ancient historical world that we learn through Egyptology and the world of the history that's recorded in the Bible. We know that you brought about all of this to bring glory to your name to bring a great deliverance to the Israelite people, the family of Jacob, and to accomplish even more throughout the years and millennia that would come afterward. So answer these prayers, we ask, and go above and beyond for the glory of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So where are we today? Today we want to pick up essentially where we left off before And last week, um, as we entered into this evidence for Israelites in Egypt before, well, after the arrival of Jacob, of course, and and before the uh, departure at the time of the Exodus, um, we were looking specifically, chronologically, at some of the beginning points. And really, I didn't have the opportunity to prove to you some of the things that I was suggesting to be true. So tonight, I will be doing that very thing, proving to you, or attempting to prove to you, that these connections can be made and that we can identify in the historical record um, several biblical figures that never before in history have we been able to, to identify. One being Joseph, one being Jacob, and we looked at the two of them at least on one inscription, the Esbet Rushdi Stella. Um, and Ephraim uh, and Manasseh, the two oldest sons of Joseph, the ones that received the birthright blessing from Jacob. Um, and specifically, Ephraim, of course, received the greater blessing, the true birthright, um, that usually is reserved for the firstborn. Um, so we have them, and um, uh, yeah, so we have Joseph and Jacob and Ephraim and Manasseh. Those four characters can be identified in the historical record. So that's what I'll be trying to prove to you tonight. So it's in addition to what we talked about last time, and we're looking at um, a number of lines of other evidence um, as well. So 
This is our goal at the beginning here to identify Ephraim and Manasseh in the ancient historical record. All right, so let's set it up with kind of a quick rundown of the, the chronology and the important connections. So uh, all of these dates that I have for these events, they were arrived at through much toil, I guess you could say, and I, I won't necessarily be attempting to prove all of the, the dates. Um, again, had, if we had more time, I would go through that. I'd spend a good solid hour on proving to you uh, the chronological connections. But, um, of course, 1876 is the, is the date that we can arrive back at because of what we know from 1 Kings 6.1, which will date uh, the Exodus at 479 plus years after, uh, I'm sorry, before the beginning of the work on the first temple under Solomon. And then uh, Exodus 12.40 and 41 tell us that that 430 years before that date, which is 1446 for the Exodus, 430 years before that, that's when Jacob entered into the land of Egypt. So that takes us to 1876. Actually, just this week, this very week between the time we last met and today, um, an article that I wrote was published by what's called NEASB, the Near Eastern Archaeological Society Bulletin. The article is on the topic of, of proving the exact length of the Israelite sojourn in Egypt. And there's, there's two divergent views on this. Um, some, such as I, would say that it's 430 years, and others say that it's 215 years for the time that they lived in Egypt. And of course, that changes an enormous amount because, you know, you're, you're now, that's a variance of 215 years. And you can't just throw caution to the wind and, you know, take both options, put them behind your hand, and, you know, have somebody pick a hand for you, and whichever one they pick, that's the one you're going to, to hold to that view. It's very complex, and it's very important, because if you don't get the chronology right, you don't get the synchronisms right. In other words, lining up the events of the Israelites' history with the, the events of Egyptian history. If it's 215 years off... Either way, whichever view is right, uh, it's chaos. It's destructive. And you're going to start assuming things. You're going to start making connections that were never meant to be made. So I attempt to prove conclusively, and there are a lot of issues in the Bible that I'm not 100% on. Maybe some of them I'm 90, 95%, 80, 70, sometimes 51%. I'm just, you know, it's, it's almost like a, you know, a, a pick em. So this is an issue that I'm 100% sure of, and that's why, with confidence, I wrote and published this article. So if you're interested in reading that, um, you're welcome to download it. It's free uh, to download. You can either get it from the Near Eastern Archaeological Society Bulletin, somehow from, from them, from, from that issue, or you can pull it off of my uh, Web page on academia.edu. So if you Google my name, Douglas Petrovich, and then... And then space, academia.edu, it will take you right to my webpage. Now, probably to download it, you would need to sign up and to be a part of academia.edu, which you can do for free. There's no cost. They'll, they'll probably try to get you to, um, to accept the offer to be part of their premium service, which you do have to pay for. I don't know. Last time I looked, it was like $10 a month. I don't know if that's changed. Um, but you don't have to do that. You can just do it for free and you, you become an independent scholar or whatever, and um, a researcher, however you want to title yourself, and then you can access all kinds of wonderful materials from biblical scholars, ancient Near Eastern historical scholars, archaeologists, you name it. And, you know, if you have a field, you know, maybe your field is um, oncology or it's... Uh, it's um, software engineering or whatever it is, there are scholars all around the world who are publishing and putting their materials for free for people to download on academia.edu. It's an amazing resource. So you can get my article and read it if you're interested. And again, in it, I try to demonstrate that 1876 has to be the right year for Jacob entering into Egypt because it's 430 years 
before the Exodus that that happens. All right, so um, some of these important events around 1876. Before this, 1885 would be the year that Joseph uh, interpreted the, the twin dreams, if you will, the, the, the paired dreams of, of the king. Um, and then in 1878, that's when we have this transition, when Sosostris II dies. He, of course, I referred to as the abundance pharaoh. We'll be looking at that a little bit more tonight, maybe. And Sosostris III, his son, comes on the throne in that year and inherits the entire throne. Um, and so he becomes what I refer to affectionately as the famine pharaoh. And it's just happenstance, from my perspective, that it happens to be the very year of that transition is also the year of the change of the seven years of abundance that ends and then the beginning of the seven years of famine. And again, we talked a little bit about that last time, so you could check out um, the discussion on that from the, the previous session we had together, if you'd like. And then after 1876, uh, a couple key events. And again, I'm just giving you the bare bones here. Uh, some of the, the most important events for our purposes, and the ones in the yellowish, orangish here on the slide, um, they indicate, I've put that color on there to show you, these are really the things we want to focus on for our time uh, tonight. So 1859 is the year that Jacob dies, and coincidentally, it happens to be the same year that Sesostris III, the famine pharaoh, decides to put his son... Amenemhat III on the throne, which of course begs the question, if you haven't thought of it, I have, which is, hmm, why, I wonder, does Sesostris III happen to put his son on the throne with him as a co-regent in the very year that Jacob dies? Could it be that Jacob's death precipitated the sense that he had that now is a good time to enter retirement, if you will? and turn over all of the duties of running the country to the sun. And that very well could be what happened. That's fully you know, speculative. I'm not suggesting it, it did, but it certainly could have. And then 1842, and, um, and, and so in this year, that's when Sinai 115 was um, inscribed. And we'll be talking about that, if not tonight, then, if all goes well, on Thursday together. And that is one of the inscriptions that actually act, acts as a, a link to join together all that we're, uh, we're, we're talking about tonight and last time with what we'll talk about on Thursday. Um, and, uh, and I will propose to you that this is the connection that we have that helps us to understand that Hebrew is the language of the world's oldest alphabetic script, which every scholar would admit goes back to the Egyptian Middle Kingdom, and that's Dynasty 12 that we were talking about last time. Okay, um, so there's a quick rundown, repetition. One of the, uh, I don't know if any, any of you have read the book from a few decades ago called The Seven Laws of the Learner. It basically teaches how to teach. And one of the laws of the learner, learner is the law of repetition. So we're, we're going to be repeating things so that it sinks into your head. That's part of teaching. Uh, anybody who's involved in education knows this to be true. So, graphically, just to see it, Sostris II equals the abundance pharaoh. And he dies at the end of the period of the seven years of abundance. Sosostris III, the famine pharaoh, Amenemhat III, he is the king whose rule began in the year of Jacob's death. Then we looked at a site last time called Avaris, and that I proposed to you, and I let you know that I wasn't the first to propose this. I've, I'm the third or fourth I know of who's proposed this publicly, that this is the site where Jacob settled his family. What you read about in uh, the end of Genesis, chapter 47, and Exodus 1 as the site or city of Ramses in Goshen. So that's Avaris. So D2 is the level, the stratigraphic level, and that, that focuses on an occupational period, a window in time where people lived there. That's the idea. It's, it's a fancy term. Um, and that's when, conclusively, without a doubt, nobody disputes this, 
the first group of Asiatics at Avaris settled at the site. That's D2. And I connect that with Jacob, and we talked about that last time. Now our focus is going to shift to the next, the subsequent A uh, Asiatic occupational phase there, the second phase. And that phase I'm connecting to the sons, the two oldest sons of Jacob, Ephraim and Manasseh. All right, relevant biblical passages. We need to start with the Bible, don't we, to set a context so we can see what it is that we want to um, connect so here's how it goes, Genesis 47, 11, then 27 and part of 28, as well as 48, 1 and 2. And they're separated by the ellipses. So Joseph, and this is my translation, so Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Now Israel... And that, of course, is the name given to Jacob. Now Israel lived in the land of Egypt, in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. And let me stop there and say, that very statement right there demonstrates that the time the Israelites spent in Egypt was not purely, exclusively under bondage, not at all. In fact, this suggests to us a long period of time of the opposite of that, prosperity. It's only for a time that they were enslaved. And to be honest, having done the, the study myself and all the hard work, I can tell you it's around 114 years of slavery out of the 430 years that they're there that they experience this... Uh, this difficulty as slaves under the Egyptian king and the crown. All right, let's pick it back up. Um, Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, and that's, again, why we know that it was 1859 when Jacob died, because it tells us he lived 17 additional years of his life after leaving Canaan and arriving in Egypt. So he dies in 1859. 1876 minus 17 is... 1859. I do know a little bit of basic math. Um, and then it says, Now it came about after these things that Joseph was told, Take note, your father is sick. So he, that is Joseph, took his two sons. Now notice I have this in red for those of you who can see the red. Uh, it's a little bit difficult on this screen, so it's the screen on your left is going to be a little bit easier to see. But this is the key part of it. So he, Joseph, took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him on the trip to visit his father who was moving toward dying. When it was told to Jacob, look, your son Joseph has come to you. Israel, that is Jacob, collected his strength and he sat up in the bed. All right, then we have another passage to look at here, verses 3 through 6 of Genesis 48. And once again, this is my translation. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. And he said to me, you see, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and I will make you a company of peoples, and will give this land to your descendants after you, for an everlasting possession. Now, and here it is, the important part. Now your two sons, we saw before who they were, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. That's the statement right there. Jacob is saying Ephraim and Manasseh are mine. Folks, this is theft going on. But it's purposeful theft. It's really important why he's doing this. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. So they're on the same level as all of Jacob's other sons. But Joseph, your offspring that have been born after them will be yours. So Jacob's not taking all of his children away from him, only two. They will be called by the names of their brothers in their inheritance. And that's referring to Ephraim and Manasseh, that final statement. 
It's not about Joseph's other children. It's about Ephraim and Manasseh. Those two will be called by the names of their brothers in their inheritance. Their brothers become their uncles, or I should say their uncles become their brothers. That's who he's talking about. So they will be on the same par with all of the other sons that Jacob had in the inheritance in the land. So, again, uh, the, the, the main thing to focus on here is Jacob's statement that he was taking away Joseph's two oldest sons. And as I told you last time, I used to think this is nothing but a plaque on the wall. Now I know it's totally different. And I hope that to some extent I may have been able to prove that to you last time. Remember how we saw that there were, um, I, think, I think we covered this last time. I definitely have mentioned this before in a similar, um, similar discussion. Um, there were, okay, the, the year after Jacob died, in year two of Amenemkat I, because Jacob had to die in year one of Amenemkat III, in year two, the very next year, we have, we have an Asiatic writing inscriptions down in the, um, in the area of the turquoise mines where the Egyptians would, would send expeditions pretty much yearly to extract turquoise to make this lucrative industry, to, to make a huge profit for Egypt. Um, some Asiatic wrote down there, and he wrote the kinds of things, number one, that are terrible Egyptian uh, grammar. That's to begin with, if you will, or, or terrible use of hieroglyphics. Uh, in, in, a, in a limited instance. Second, um, that the same term was used there that's found on the Esbet Rushdi Stella that's at Avaris. This, this term, head of the household, with a hieroglyph next to it that demonstrates that it's a high person. It's a person very high up who has this title. And so this is a strong suggestion that it's the house of Pharaoh in mind that, that this has. And this is a, you know, on the Esbet Rushdie Stella et of ours, this is an unprecedented use of this, what we affectionately refer to as the touchdown hieroglyph, the high person hieroglyph. And yet we see that repeated starting in year two down at the turquoise mines one year later. And that same person who writes those things at Maghara, is going, we're going to find him writing things at the sister site, the other turquoise mine that's close by to Maghara called Serebit el Khadim. And so that will be our focus tonight. But again, the point is that Jacob is stealing away Ephraim and Manasseh. And because he stole them away, that's why Manasseh, and I'll, I'll be trying to prove to you, Manasseh is, one of, is the person who did the writing of those inscriptions, the inscribing of, on those stones, that was Manasseh, Joseph's oldest son. That's what I'll be attempting to prove to you tonight. All right, um, so remember we looked at a little bit of the architecture that was there at the site of Avaris last time, so we're going to look briefly here at the house that was occupied by, and again, this, I'm suggesting to you this to you, um, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh in the second occupational phase at Avaris after 1859, that's stratum D1. And um, you'll remember that Avaris is located um, in the uh, eastern Nile Delta, most of the way up on the east, uh, eastern, northeastern side. And, um, and last time, of course, I tried to prove to you that that site can be connected to biblical Ramses, which a later uh, Israelite scribe, probably in the period of the judges, maybe in the early monarchy, one, of, one or two of those periods, a, a scribe who knew about where that site was, but who knew that the site name that Moses would have used is a site name no longer used of that site. So he updates it to a modern version of that site, um, which is Ramses. And that's, again, what, what I tried to demonstrate to you last time. So um, this time I want to look more closely at, um, for a moment, 
um, the, the area where the excavations were done, where the Asiatics were living, and they found this enormous mansion, if you will, this estate that's just room after room after room after room. It's so elaborate. It's so um, well-constructed. It's so massive that when the excavators were working on it, it took them you know, the good part of 40 years to excavate what they did excavate, and they didn't excavate at all. Um, they concluded that it was a palace. So we're going to be putting that conclusion on trial tonight. So the area to look at in this, you know, if you look at the, the slide here, it's on the left side, the far left side, just below um, center, and so it's a, an area in black squares there. This is a big set of black squares, and there's an, a red asterisk next to it, and that's signifying that this is an area, excuse me, where the um, archaeological team was digging and where they were working on excavating this massive mansion. So uh, this slide shows you a lot of the rooms of the, um, of the mansion as they were excavated and, and superimposed, you know, superimposing uh, complete walls where usually there's just fragments of walls here and there. So they're, they're fully drawing in for you what it would have looked like. And as you can see, it's just as I told you, it's room after room after room. So it's, it's all throughout the upper right quadrant in this drawing. What you see in the center and the lower left and lower center um, part of this uh, plate is um, mainly a cemetery. Uh, it's the place where they had to bury the people, and of course they buried them close by. So that's going to end up being a huge um, boon for us, being that the excavators uh, excavated or, or um, um, found and, and dug up the, the remnants of these graves that were there. Graves of different size, uh, which signifies people of different levels, different stature, different levels of prosperity. That's how it worked in the ancient world. Like it or not, it's like it is today. You know, you go to any typical seminary, uh, haha, that's an interesting <laughs> statement, any cemetery today, and you look around and there are these, if you will, if you don't mind the term, cheap little shallow graves, maybe with the name plate at the most. You know, there, there are places, there are cemeteries with unmarked graves. And then it goes all the way up to these huge mausoleums, right? Elaborate, well-built stone chambers where a person is laid to rest. So it all depends on your bank account as to how elaborate your grave is nowadays. And of course, you know, you could talk to me about, uh, what's our term for the burning of the bodies? Uh, cremation. You could talk to me about a, a shift to cremation. Okay, I don't want to go there, but... Um, that's the way it was in the ancient world. The way it is today is the way it was in the ancient world. You have the separate levels. So we're going to be looking at a burial that's really important, that's connected to um, an important historical figure. And he has a, a very large grave and incredible grave goods. And that's an archaeological term. It, it basically means that which was buried with the person. And usually it's part of or in some cases, m most of or all of the possessions of that person that are buried next to the person. They're not always you know, given away to the sons or the grandsons or granddaughters or whatever to the family members. Um, oftentimes, part or all of the possessions of that person are buried with that person. So that's typical. And of course, the Egyptian mentality is you get these possessions to have with you, to take with you into the afterlife so that when you revive, they're right there for your use. And, you know, it's, it's debatable whether the Israelites living there in Egypt at this time adopted that, that mentality or not. That's very debatable. And I don't even, for me, it's probably a 50-50 proposition. It easily could be either way but don't discount either option. All right, 
Um, so I refer to this massive complex of, of rooms, you know, mansion, villa, whatever you want to call it. I refer it to it, to it affectionately as the Egyptianized Asiatic residence, uh, which you can abbreviate to E-A-R, ear, the Egyptianized Asiatic residence. This is exclusively for the second occupational phase, and it exists in all three sub-phases of the second Asiatic occupational phase. In fact, it's probably built on and, and improved all throughout or throughout much or most of, its, um, of, its, uh, of the period of, that, of those three sub-phases. All right, and so the center of the activity is essentially in the area that's just, okay, so it's in the upper right, and there are two rooms that are there that uh, have been termed by my a fellow archaeologist friend of mine, actually my um, archaeology mentor, Bryant Wood, as twin master bedrooms. And I think he's probably right. They're essentially um, symmetrical with one another. Again, looking in the upper right. And that's probably where the two main inhabitants of this um, Again, mansion, villa, whatever, where they lived. Now, of course, um, for us to look at, a, at an ancient structure and say it's a palace, what has to be there physically in the palace for that to be a palace? Who can tell me? Well, it could be a ruler, but chances are he would never ended up there, did he? Probably wasn't buried in his palace. What else could we have that would define it clearly? This is a palace. Throne room, exactly. And that's, that's the equation. No throne room equals no palace. Every palace has to have a throne room because that's where the king has his audiences with people. That's where he displays his grandeur and shows people how powerful he is. So in this entire building that as much as has been excavated and we think we've hit the heart of it for sure there is no pal there is no throne room which tells me no matter what the archaeologists who excavated it said in print it's not a palace. But instead we have these two master bedrooms. What's, what else is interesting is that again these are all Asiatics here. No, no disputing it, they're Asiatics. But in this second occupational phase, all of what's built is built according to Egyptian architectural design and style, not Asiatic. And all of the measurements are made according to the Egyptian measurement system. And they even found an Egyptian plumb bob there that was used in part of the construction, the, the preparation for you know, the walls or whatever it was that they were working on. So everything there is Egyptian in this second occupational phase, which is fascinating, isn't it? When you think, what did Jacob say? I'm taking away Ephraim and Manasseh. Where were Ephraim and Manasseh born and raised? Egypt. They were thoroughly Egyptianized, weren't they? Their dad was the second in command, their mother came from a priestly line, and they would have had all of the perks of Egypt, including the ability to bring construction engineers along with their tools and with their materials to be able to build for them. Interestingly enough, and again, we have two twin master bedrooms, which fits perfectly if Ephraim and Manasseh are those two um, main occupants of the structure. All right, but let's look at the tomb of one of these um, residents here, one of the massive tombs, not just a small tomb. It's probably the second largest tomb that's there, if I'm not mistaken, as I, as I look at it. Um, and again, this is occupational phase, uh, or stratum D1, phase G4. And this is the tomb of a man named D. Sobek M. Chat. So just to the 
left and down a hair from the center of this image. Um, in red, I've put in red here where the um, building is, where the, where the tomb is, and that's the tomb that we're going to look at. There's tombs around it, there are tombs in, in our view below it and to the lower right and so forth, but this is the one tomb we're going to look at. And here it is, kind of blown up, uh, up close, if you will. This is grave three. Actually, do I list the tomb here? No, I don't list it here, but um, this is grave three. This is a man uh, that I'm equating with Ephraim. I'll, I'll take you to the end of the book and read the end for you um, before I take you back to the earlier part and walk you through it. He is clearly known as the ruler of retinue. Does anyone remember from last week? What is retinue? Exactly. It's what the Egyptians called the people, the Asiatics, who lived in the Levant. They are Retchenu people. This guy, his title that you're going to see as time goes along here, is the ruler of Retchenu. That doesn't necessarily mean he ruled in Retchenu, but it means his derivation is Retchenu. Because he's ruling here. He's ruling at Avaris. That's the whole point. He's, he's like the mayor of the city. And that's undisputed. Okay, um, so grave three. What does grave three look like? And here's a little bit of a blow-up, if you will, of, of this grave. Oh, here, here's the, the name for the grave. If you want the official name, it's tomb F1M18, grave three. How's that? This is an area F1, stratum D1, second occupational phase of the Asiatics. This is with the superstructure collapse visible. In other words, the roofing fell down on the entire structure, and you're kind of, it's as if you're standing over it looking down, and you see the bricks or whatever it was that was from above, and they're, they're collapsed downward. So before we look, uh, look into what's under those bricks, if you will, we're going to see what's around it that's connected to this structure. Well, not only were people buried here, but animals were buried here. In fact, in the upper right, you can see that there's a donkey burial. In the lower right, you can see there's a goat burial and another donkey burial. So in total, um, looking at the animals that were buried here with the ruler of Retchenu, there were five sheep and goat burials and three donkey burials. Now, does that sound like a pauper to you in the ancient world? No, it's not. It's somebody who has wealth for sure, in addition to status. And so whether, you know, under what conditions did these animals die and were, were they buried there, it's difficult to say. They may have been, um, not euthanized, what's the word I would use here? Put down, they may have been put down at the time that he died, kind of to, to go with his death because he died, his possessions shouldn't be, you know, given away to people, including the animals, so they should be put down and buried next to him. That's potentially what happened here. But anyway, you have all those animals. Now, of course, um, what did the Israelites use when they went down? Remember the sons of Jacob? They went down to visit um, Egypt at the time of the famine. Jacob sent his sons. What, did, what were they traveling on? Maseratis? What? Donkeys, exactly. What do we have here? Donkeys. That's At this time in Egypt's history, that's not an animal that the, that the Egyptians typically use. It's semi-frowned upon. But these are Asiatics, aren't they? So let's take away the collapsed superstructure and now look at what's inside. Well, there are several burial chambers here within the tomb, this massive tomb, and one of them, the one in the upper left in the screen, I've, I've circled with red or put in a rectangle, a red rectangle, and that's where the main occupant was buried. That's the guy we're looking at. But in total, before we get to that, inside here there were human burials consisting of three men, two women, one juvenile. That's the term that's used by the German excavator, German-speaking excavator. They use the word juvenile. So I, I put it there for you, the same word they use. And one infant, probably all members of the same family. All right, now let's look 
at the very place where this man was buried. And this is a drawing of his bones. I don't know how well you can see this. The bones and anything else that was found inside that, that one chamber. And again, it's the upper left quadrant from, from that previous slide. So look at the material finds that were found there. Faience beads, round beads that were made of faience and gold foil, right? Gold. Does that catch your attention? Amethyst scarab. You don't get amethyst, folks, if you are a pauper in Egypt. And a golden ring, a golden bracelet with an amethyst, a silver bracelet, an alabaster jar with a lid, socketed javelin that includes silver or bronze, a dressed dagger with a tang of bronze alloy and gold, a bronze narrow-bladed axe with a square cross-section. All of these things were found inside this burial chamber. And what we're going to focus on among all of these grave goods, and again, um, I'll, I'll stress it again, the important thing to catch here, if you, you know, if, if you miss everything else, notice how, where this man's status was. He, his grave goods were not just a bunch of, you know, um, pickup sticks. He had, he had the goods. He was rich. He was a wealthy, powerful man. Whoever he was, that's true of him, the ruler of Rechenu. But we're going to focus on this one thing. It's number three. It's in the lower right corner of this rectangular um, burial chamber, if you will. It's number three on the list, the amethyst scarab and golden ring. And here it is, um, a blow-up of it. You can see the golden ring going around, and it's this beautiful... Um, purplish amethyst stone that's been finely carved. So you can see great craftsmanship that's involved in this. And on the outside of it is a, if you will, um, a slew of hieroglyphs, which of course makes my eyes light up because Egyptian language is, that's my thing. It was the first minor of my PhD, ancient Egyptian language. So this thrilled me when I first came in contact with, with this amethyst uh, scarab seal. And as you can see, part of it in the upper part of the view here was broken off. But thankfully, we can restore what would have been there in the top, which is really kind of neat. So um, what it says, looking at the restored part and what we see is, Hecha en rechenu di sobek em chat which undoubtedly blesses all of your souls, right? That means the ruler of Rechenu, that's the title of the man, and then his name, D. Sobek Amchat, and we'll come back to that, the meaning of his name later. So this is good Egyptian right here, folks. You always have the title first of the person and then his name. That's how it works, every time without exception. All right, so we want to know how, how can we restore this confidently to Hecha and Rechenu, the ruler of Rechenu, because the ruler of, and then the beginning of the word Rechenu, or most of the word Rechenu, is gone. It's not even visible. In fact, there's just a little bit of it that's of the R, of the equivalent of the R that's visible. And then the rest of it's there. Etchenu, if you will, and then Di Sobek Emchat. Okay, um, and there are the individual hieroglyphs that, um, that I break down for you in case you're interested in all of the detail. Um, but the, the meaning of the name, and I'll just tell you that much so far, the meaning of the name D. Sobek Amchat is he who was appointed by Sobek Amchat. So the name so so this guy's name has someone else's name in it. Isn't that strange? To have a name that part of your name is somebody else's name. But if his name is he who was appointed by Sobek Amchat, is um, if that's this guy's name, who's greater, D Sobek Amchat or Sobek Amchat? Sobek Amchat is greater, yes, because this guy is only one who is appointed by that person. So the appointer is higher than the appointee. That's how it works in the world from ancient times until today. All right, 
So let's go further. How can we, we restore the top of this to Hecha and Retchen, uh, R, Hecha and R for the Retchenu? Well, if we go to the mines and we looked at those last time, and last time we looked at Maghara down in Sinai, a long trip, a long hike, if you will, down from Avaris in the Nile Valley. Um, at those mines, one of the these Asiatic writers who inscribed these things on stone down there during these um, mostly annual trips to the to the mines. Um, he wrote down his, on one inscription, he wrote down his title and his name. And that helps us to restore the missing part on the, um, the amethyst scarab seal from Avaris, which shows you a connection between the two places, between Avaris and Egypt and um, uh, the mines down in Sinai. So his name... Or, no, I'm sorry, his title is Sen En Cheka En Rechenu, and then his name is Chebederem. What does all that mean? Sen En means um, brother of. Then Cheka En is ruler of, and then Rechenu is what you know to be the Levant, and then the name Chebeded. And the name Chebeded here has an M on the end. You can see it in the sign of an owl. So, um, again, this is just above the middle of your screen, toward the left, as it reads right to left. And in the farther, farthest position, there's the remnants there of an owl. The owl makes the M sound, the phonetic M sound. And that letter, that, if you will, or that hieroglyph, technically, is, it's funny because... Chebeded writes his name a number of times during a number of his journeys down to the site when he's inscribing things. Sometimes he writes Chebededem, sometimes he writes just Chebeded, which screams out something really important to us if we, if we have studied Semitic languages. And that is that you have this optional M. And this optional M, it's called mimation. And what it means is that several of the... Semitic languages had the opportunity to add this M sound, usually to a noun, or to not include it. Totally the, the speaker's or the writer's um, prerogative, whether it's there. So this clearly screams out at us that it's an Asiatic person who's writing this, because his name reflects this mimation, which is not Egyptian at all. And Hebrew is one of the languages that uses mimation. Isn't that amazing? And that bring, begs the question, um, what is the meaning of chebeded then? If, if the root part of it is chebeded, we can, we can take off the optional m sound, m. If chebeded is the root, what does that mean? And it took me a while to figure this one out. This name... I can tell you right now, from all of the best sources that are out there, the, the Egyptological sources for studying the Egyptian language, of all of those sources, not one of them lists this name of any other person than this guy who's taking these trips down to the mines. Nobody else in Egyptian history has this name. It's an Egyptian name, not a Semitic name. What does it mean? And again, it took me a long time to figure this one out. It is a perfect passive participle. Isn't that pretty cool? You like grammar? It's a perfect passive participle. It means... Um, it means... Um, oh, what's my term? He who was... No. Um, okay, all of a sudden the English word is escaping me. Um, Chebeded. Okay, it means, it means the person from whom um, something of importance uh, was taken away from him. That's what it means. And I'll, I'll come up with a word that I'm looking for in a minute, hopefully. But that's, that's, this, that's the point of, of the meaning of this name. So something was um, taken away from this person. 
Now, who has a name that something was taken away from you? Isn't that strange? Um, and yet he has this kind of name. So what's the significance? Well, go back to the story of, um, of uh, when ja Joseph goes down to visit ja Jacob who's dying, right? And when, when Jacob is about to die, uh, Jacob is just before Jacob is about to die, it's time for the children of Joseph who've, who've gone with him to receive their level of blessing. And of course, one of them is going to get the birthright, the main blessing. And Joseph expects that his father's right hand would be put on the older, which is Manasseh, and his left hand on the, the younger of the two, and that's how you give the blessing and the birthright to the oldest. So instead, when Joseph brings the two sons in front of his father, the, what, what the wily old fox Jacob does is he does this deal that and he puts the right hand on the head of the younger and the left hand on the older and he starts giving the blessings and joseph says dad let's hit the brakes your old age has overcome you this is the older one and this is the younger give the right blessing to the right son of mine please and jacob of course he's expecting this he's planned this all ahead probably he says, yes, my son, the older will be great, but his brother will be greater. Yes. Therefore, he receives the greater blessing, the birthright. Um, so, oh, uh, so one of the words I could have used is favor. Um, he who, ha that's it. He who has been disfavored, that's the meaning. He who has been disfavored disfavored. Favor was taken away from him. That's the meaning, meaning of Chebeded. That fits Manasseh to a T, doesn't it? And in the ancient world, of course, you, receive, you didn't have to receive just one name. You could receive multiple names. But one of the names, um, uh, but, but what's true of every name that you would receive in life, however many names you received, they were things that distinguished you as a person. So this person, whoever Chebedet is, he's a guy who, among all the things that you could say about him, what really distinguishes him, makes him different than anybody else, is that favor was taken away from him in a major way. That would be true of Manasseh. So I suggest to you that this is Manasseh. Now, I hope you're a good critic who says, that's all well and good, maybe you're right, it makes sense, okay, I can see how that fits but you still haven't proven it to me yet. And I would say to you, nope, I haven't, and I'm not done. So let's get on our horses and go a little further. Serbit Echadim, this is that sister site to Maghara. So in Sinai, it's in the lower left part of Sinai, Serbit Echadim. Um, this is the site of these turquoise mines that the Egyptians exploited. And in addition to the featuring of donkeys, the common thread between the, the two sites of Avaris and Sirbit el Hadim is this ruler of retinue designation. Because in Avaris, we have the ruler of retinue. And in these ex mining expeditions down to Sinai, we have the brother of the ruler of retinue. Now, between the two of them, which one is higher and which one is lower in stature? Who's higher? Yeah, the one who's up, the ruler. Because the brother only has a title in relation to his brother, the ruler. True? So he's got to be lower. It's logical. And, of course, the, one who, the ruler who's up at Avaris, um, yeah, okay, I'll come to that in a minute when I work more at proving this to you. So this is a drawing of, it's a reconstruction of this site of Serbit el Khadim. Uh, where these expeditions took place. And you can see that they went down there and they didn't only extract turquoise, but they were very busy. So they had a huge team. There were miners and there were other people who served other purposes uh, on the team. Uh, some of them would have been in charge of uh, drawing water. There was a baker on the team. We know that from an inscription that I translated that's in my book. That, By the way, I'll be bringing whatever, however many copies I have of my book um, that identifies 
Egypt, uh, Hebrew as the language of the oldest alphabetical script. However many copies I, ha I have, I'll bring them on Thursday, and I'll sell them at cost. What it costs me to buy it with my discount and have it shipped from Jerusalem to here, I'll sell them at that cost, which is $50 even if anyone is interested. And I don't know how many I have left. It's probably somewhere around half a dozen. Um, but um, so on one of the inscriptions that's from the, it's in walking distance of here, it's where they drew water from for the, for the expedition. There was an inscription found. It's the oldest Hebrew inscription. It's four letters long. It's two words and four letters. That's, I guess, the, the Vulcan way to, to show it. Live long and prosper. Um, but this was a baker. He claimed himself to be a baker. And sure enough, on part of the, you know, one of the functions of, of someone on the expedition would have been to bake the bread needed for the people to survive every day so they could go in the mines and do the work. Um, and you had other jobs. And well, some people were cons working construction. They were engineers and they were builders here. And so they were building um, buildings and edifices that were part of this worship cult. There was a huge worship cult there to the goddess Hathor. Um, she is designated in form, if you want to know about the iconography, she's designated as the cow goddess, if you will. So when you see her represented in um, zoomor zoomorphological means, it's as a cow. And that, of course, makes sense because the Israelites at the time of the Exodus were coming down here as slaves to the same site and writing inscriptions and complaining about the harsh conditions and the horrors that they were suffering, and this is all in the, the translation of the inscriptions that are in my book, they complained about all of this. And then, of course, when they leave and exit Egypt, what is the first thing that they construct when Moses is up talking to God? Yeah, a calf, the, the child of a cow. And so it connects perfectly with the worship that was going on here. And of course, in the, if I didn't mention this last Thursday, uh, Jeremiah tells us that in, from God speaking that going all the way back to the days of the Israelites in Egypt, they were worshiping false gods all the way back then. And this is verification of it. And that's, that's clearly in the inscriptions that are in my book. They're, they're worshiping um, Baalat, which is the Levantine way to say Hathor. They are, they are attributing her with great wonders. So that's their idolatry. They're worshiping, along with the Egyptians, the pagan, um, the, the patron deity of Serebit el Khadim, Hathor. They're worshiping the cow goddess right there with the Egyptians. All right, um, and this is just a quick kind of modern snapshot of the site so that you can see what it's like there. Folks, this isn't the Taj Mahal. This is the nasty part of the desert where there's sun, sand, and heat. That's all you get. And of course, oddly enough, there's turquoise there, so that's what brings the people down to this area. Here's one of the mines as mined in the time period of the new kingdom, that's the lifetime of Moses. And remember, I told you the Israelites were going down there as slaves at the time and mining. This would have been one of the mines that those Israelites worked in Moses' day, undoubtedly. You can see the pick marks on the top. You can see they left columns behind where they would, you know, they would chip away at the stone, right, all going deep in. But they would have to leave these columns there so that it doesn't collapse on top of them. Um, and therefore, this is um, a good view of mine N from the New Kingdom period. And then they have these stele. And of course, remember when I showed you that slide with the drawing of, we, we were trying to demonstrate how we can reconstruct the missing part on the um, amethyst scarab seal. Because on one of the inscriptions that's just like this, it looks like a, a tombstone, you know, like a 19th century tombstone, but it's eight to nine feet high. That's how tall it is. It's inscribed in Egyptian hieroglyphs on the front, on the back, and on the sides. And at the bottom of the ones that this Chebeded guy, this Asiatic that I'm connecting to, to Manasseh, on, 
on the, um, on the, at the base of these, he was drawing pictures and writing captions. He's like, you know, an ancient animator, if you will. He loves to draw and give a little, you know, you know how you have on these, these comics, right? They have the, you have a person talking and you have this circle and it's that, what that person's saying. It's similar to that. That's what he does. And it's always at the base of the stella. So Sinai 115, the black arrow is pointing to it. At the base of it, that's the one where we have something very important written and we'll either get to that today or next time. Well, at the base of a different one, that was Sinai 115. This is Sinai 112. This is, this is where we have the drawing that, that we looked at the, the drawn form. This is the actual inscription itself, the stella itself. And this is where it says, Chebedet, brother of, ruler of, of the ruler of Rechenu. And so you can see the lines of hieroglyphics above it. And that's describing what happened during that trip during that, exp that year's expedition to the mines. And here it is, Sinai 112, that we looked at. So um, you can see, uh, first of all, notice to, the, to our left, in the lower left, we have an attendant, and that's what it says. This is the attendant of Chebedet. So Chebedet is kind of the big shot, or, or you can at least say one of the big shots on the expedition. In this, in this scene, he is the big shot. And there's an attendant behind him with, with a stick over his shoulder. The British, I'm using the British word here. It's the British word butler. He's called a, you know, by the, um, the, uh, the British scholar from the 20th century who, who translates this, he calls him a butler. And, and in the other description, it's his attendant. And then it gives his name, and it's an Egyptian name, Chekbi. So Chekbi is this attendant, this butler, who, who attends to the needs of Chebedet. And then to our far right and the lower right is a, an unnamed youth. And notice how tall he is. He's like a little boy, isn't he? Notice how tall he is in relation to the donkey. And that's going to come in ha handy for us later in, in comparing other drawings that come in later years of future expeditions. So in this early expedition, the, the unnamed youth is very small. Um, then, in a later expedition, we have, there's Chebedet sitting on, um, on the donkey, and we know the colors of these because this inscription, this stella, was found inside the temple with a bunch of sand up against it, so the sand preserved some of the original paint. So it was painted. Every one of these stelae would have been painted. And the paint colors show Yellow, for the skin color, that's the color that Egyptians used to depict an Asiatic. And then they have these, call them what you want, skirts. You know, if you want to have fun with this. I would call them kilts. That They're usually called kilts in the literature. They have these kilts on their waist, these, these men. Chebedet has one, the Egyptian has one behind him, and the youth to the right has one. And they, they're, they're banded, if you will. They're, they're white and, and red. And so, um, and again, um, this is the same kind of uh, imagery that we see of the Asiatics up in Avaris, which we'll see in a moment. But on the left, this attendant, the guy with the, the stick or the spear or whatever it is um, over his shoulder, um, is a, once again is an Egyptian because he has an Egyptian name. And, and this time his name is Apim. Right to left over his head is the writing Apim in hieroglyphics. Apim, once again, an Egyptian name, but a different one than the previous attendant from a different year. That was Chekbi. So the attendants change over time, year to year or whatever. That's clear, the Egyptian attendants. But notice the youth getting taller on the right. Do you notice how much bigger he is in this one than the last one? This time, though, he is named. His name is not an Egyptian name. His name, if you can read hieroglyphics, is very clear to you, or it should be clear, except for the fact that one or two of these hieroglyphics is kind of poorly drawn on here, is um, Shechem in Egyptian. It's written in Egyptian, but it's a Semitic name. Shechem. Shechem. That's his name. Hmm. 
Shechem. Who could be named Shechem? So when I was in the process of my research and I realized we may have Manasseh here, the guy sitting on the donkey, it would make perfect sense. The timing's perfect, the name's perfect, um, the connection with you know, he being the, the lesser of the two brothers, the brother of the ruler of Retchenu and the ruler of Retchenu up in Avaris, everything fits. So now, who, who, who is the Semitic youth that's leading the donkey in front of this dignitary on the trip, Chebeded? His name is Shechem. Where, does, where do we find Shechem? And again, I thought maybe this is Manasseh. So you know what I did? I found the one place, and there's only one place in the Bible, where Manasseh's sons are named. It's in the book of Joshua. You go to the book of Joshua, you look at the names of the sons of Manasseh. Guess what you find there? One of the sons of the name, uh, the name of one of the sons of Manasseh is Shechem. Isn't that amazing? Shechem is the name of of one of Manasseh's sons. What's the chance that the youth who grows from trip to trip, who's connected with Chebedet, what's the chance that he would have the name, the Hebrew name of one of Manasseh's children? It's one in a gazillion. This becomes the linchpin that settles the issue. There's no way that all of these coincidences could be true, especially this one. So everything now becomes founded on the identification of Manasseh's son, Shechem, who evidently went on trips yearly with his father. He had some interest in everything that went down and, you know, went on down in the mines. And so, Dad, let me go with you. And he would go every year. Wow, isn't that amazing? So notice the connections between what we find at Serebit in Sinai versus what we find at Avaris. In the upper left, of course, it's the yellow-skinned Asiatics with the kilts that have the um, stripes, the white and red stripes that, that alternate. And then those same striped kilts are found on this ceiling, ceiling 8314, that was found at Tel El Daba. Tel El Daba is the modern name for Avaris. Wow. So not only did they find people, young people apparently, with kilts on, but they found that there was a person in the foreground, you know, looking at the drawing in the bottom center of the, um, of the slide. You can see that there's a man there who's carrying around his waist, or at his waist, a shepherd's crook. And of course, to carry a shepherd's crook means that you're a shepherd. What were the Israelites? Shepherds. It all fits. So there it is, Joshua 17, 2, Shechem equals the Bible's Shechem, the son of Manasseh. And there's the passage itself, so you can see all the names in Joshua 17, 2 of the sons of um, Manasseh. And there, in the middle of the, of the, um, of the quote from, from that verse, is the statement, and for the sons of Shechem. So we have Joseph the grandfather, Manasseh, uh, the father, and then Shechem, the grandson of Joseph. All right, um, the narrow-bladed axe, um, I'm, for time's sake, I'm going to skip all of this and not talk to you about it. I'm going to come to this slide with the time we ha little time we have left. Who is Sobek M. Chat? Because we already talked about D. Sobek M. Chat. He's, he's the mayor of the city of Avars. He was appointed by the Sobek M. Chat. Who is Sobek M. Chat? And I suggested to you from last time that, that Joseph had several Egyptian names. One of them was Sasobek. One of them was Hor M. Chat Jr. Well, if you take the two names and you conflate them into one, which very potentially could have happened later in life for Joseph in Egypt, if some people were calling him one and some were calling him another, let's just conflate the two into one. So Sasobek and Hor M. Chat becomes Sobek M. Chat, which means the God of the life-giving waters of the Nile River is at the forefront for this man, meaning in everything he does, he puts that God first. And I submit to you that's what Joseph did. He was the one who provided for Egypt, humanly speaking, 
through the life-giving waters of the Nile, redirecting the Nile's waters into the Fayum and creating this breadbasket. And so his name reflects what he did of significance. Well, can I prove to you that Sobek, and this is the last thing we'll do, can I prove that Sobek Emchat is, oh, actually, we, I won't do that today. I'll do that on Thursday because of time. I will prove to you on Thursday who Sobek Emchat is, and certainly I'll be proving that he's, um, uh, attempting to prove that he is Joseph, but then we'll also look at these, um, a little bit about these inscriptions that are, that are in my book that of, are of great historical value. So the one thing to tie this up with a bow that I didn't really um, emphasize is, okay, we've got Manasseh identified. We have Manasseh's son Shechem identified. Last time we had Joseph identified. Di Sobek Amchat, he who was appointed by Sobek Amchat. So if we can, at least for today, accept uh, for the sake of argument that Joseph is Sobek Amchat, Di Sobek Amchat is the brother of Manasseh, who went down as the brother of the ruler of Retinue to be part of this mining expedition. So he was one of the, the central figures in those expeditions, and his brother would be Ephraim. So Di Sobek Amchat would be Ephraim. And that makes sense, wouldn't it? I mean, if you got the, the birthright, if you were going to be the greater of the two brothers then when it was time to decide which one of you is going to stay at the homestead in, you know, mild climate um, Nile Delta, and which one of you was going to go on a long trip every year down into the desert to, to extract turquoise, and, you know, if you're the ruler of Rechenu, if you're, Man if you're Ephraim, whom do you pick? Do you send yourself down there? Or do you send your brother down there? Well, I can tell you, every time I would pick, I send my brother. So there's Manasseh. He's stretched out in his, in his executive chair. You know, he's got a cigar. He's got grapes. He's got air conditioning in his house there in that, in that Egyptianized Asiatic residence, right, in the, in the most beautiful of the rooms. And he calls his brother in. His brother comes through the door and he says, Guess where you get to go this year? Yep, back down to the mines. You're in charge. So he sends his brother down there. And of course, Manasseh gets the dirtier job of the two. You know, there's a show called Dirty Jobs. They could do a, an episode on the life of Manasseh down at the, at, the, at the mines, at the turquoise mines. So that's who Ephraim is. He's the ruler of Retchen. He's the mayor of the city of Avaris. We saw last time that in the lifetime of Joseph, that um, the guy on the named on the Esbet Rushdie Stella, who's Sasobek, right, and he's Choremchat Jr. We saw that that he um, was called the ruler of or the controller of the city, right. So in the days, in the years just after the the Israelites moved down into Egypt, Joseph is the mayor of Avaris at that time. But then as time goes along, his sons grow up. His grandfather, his father is going to die. His, his father takes away Ephraim and Manasseh and says they're going to live with their uncles here. And next time we'll talk about the significance of that. But what, what um, oh, I've lost my train of thought. What, what Joseph would have, oh, so... What Joseph would have done with all of these events transpiring is turn over the effectual control of the city to someone else who's local. Whom better to select than his son who's been appointed by his grandfather as the grandson to receive the birthright? Whom better? Ephraim. So at that point, Joseph would have deeded over the mayor's key or whatever it signifies the mayor, right? He would have deeded that responsibility over to Ephraim as Ephraim was you know, moved down there and had grown up. And therefore, he became the next controller of the city, the ruler of Retchenu, who was the mayor in the city of Avaris. Does that make sense? Okay, so next time we will wrap it up on this Thursday to come. Let's pray. 
Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity that we had tonight to look into some of these amazing historical events that connect ancient Egypt with the world of the Bible, the history of what took place in the lifetime of Joseph and his father and his sons and his grandson and other grand, grandchildren. Um, what an amazing journey that you've given us together in these times to see the beauty, the splendor, the, the awe of, um, of your hand at work. For thousands of years, all of this was hidden from the historical record, but now you've chosen to make it known to us today. It's for a purpose. It's for a lot of purposes. I think at the top of them is for our awe of you to grow and increase, to say how amazing you are, to give us a physical record of all that you did or part of what you did in fulfilling your, your will as we read about it in the pages of the Bible. We thank you for this privilege and prepare our hearts for the final session that we'll spend together even on Thursday if you should allow us to meet. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.